Today we are going to the book of Genesis chapter 44 from verse 14 to verse 34. And today the sermon topic is True Repentance Part 2. So starting in verse 14. Joseph was still in the house when Judah and his brothers came in and they threw themselves to the ground before him. Joseph said to them, What is this you have done? Don't you know that a man like me can find things out by definitions? What can we say to my Lord? Judah replied, What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. We are now my Lord's slaves, we ourselves and the one who was found to have the cup. But Joseph said, Far be it from me to do such a thing. Only the man who was found to have the cup will become my slave. The rest of you go back to your father in peace. Then Judah went up to him and said, Please, my lord, let your servant speak a word to my lord. Do not, let, do not be angry with your servant, though you are equal to Pharaoh himself. My lord asked his servants, Do you have a father or a brother? And we answered, We have an aged father, and there is a young son born to him in his old age. His brother is dead, and he is the only one of his mother's sons left, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me so I can see him for myself. And we said to my Lord, The boy cannot leave his father. If he leaves him, his, fa his father will die. But you told your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you will not see my face again. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him what my Lord has said. Then our father said, Go back and buy a little more food. But we said, We cannot go down. Only if our youngest brother is with us will we go. We cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Your servant, my father, said to us, You know that my wife bore me two sons. One of them went away from me, and I said, He has surely been torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. If you take this one from me too, and harm comes to him, you will bring my grey head down to the grave in misery. So now, if the boy is not with us when I go back to yourself and my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life, sees that the boy isn't there, he will die. Your servants will bring the grey head of our father down to the grave in sorrow. Your servant guarantee the boy's safety to my father, I said. If I do not bring him back to you, I will bear the blame before you, my father, all my life. Now then, please let your servant remain here as my lord's slave in place of the boy, and let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the mystery that would come upon my father. So, this is the rest of the chapter 44, and as we look at this part of this uh, scripture, we saw that Judah practically summarized what had happened since chapter 42. So at the first glance, you may see that, okay, this text, well, we have been reading it over and over again. And this part of the scripture practically, well, just repeating itself. So what is it so special that we need to pause here to you know think about reflect about because practically i already know all the main points here but then if you dig a little bit deeper and put yourself back into the character situation and forgot forget about like what you know will come next in chapter 45 and the rest of it you would actually see something different and from this perspective on you would see what our sermon topic talks about true repentance from this part of the scripture so don't let yourself go too fast ahead and thinking that okay after this you know i know exactly what's going to happen and they are going to reunite as a family etc etc so forget about all those part of the scripture and just focus on just this time frame in judah's life in joseph's life and in all the brothers life so what were they focusing on so at first a little reminder about the entire situation none of the brother recognized the man in charge of egypt was actually their own brother joseph whom they sold like maybe 20 something years ago and right now they had no idea why this entire uh, episode about the cup would be found 
in Benjamin's sack. So in the brother's uh, perspective, all this thing had happened in Egypt is from God. Okay, a divine judgment upon the sins, right, 22 years ago when they sold Joseph, their own brother. And that's why God had chased them, you know, chased the sins at, at this particular moment. It's exactly a mirror as to what had happened before. And so in the brother's perspective, this is God's judgment upon their sins. And that's why if you only focus on what happened next or you, well, read this part of the scripture for so many times, you cannot help yourself. But to fast forward, well, I pray that you would stop at this chapter and understand the situation right here. And so given the fact that, you know, Judah and all the brothers realize and recognize that this must be divine judgment. And that's why they were at this point confessing their sins. And so look at, um, let's see, uh, verse 16 again. When the time Judah replied to Joseph, God has uncovered your servant's guilt, okay? The servant's guilt is not really referring back to the cup only, okay? In the brother's perspective, it is regarding to the sin selling their own brother 22 years ago. And right now, all this had happened and they have to resolve it right here and right now. And that's why this part, especially in this entire chapter, chapter 44, is a confession from Judah and on behalf of all the brothers in front of Joseph, whom they did not know was Joseph, they just confess their sins. And in this confession, you can practically see that they literally repent. They regret of their sin selling Joseph 22 years ago. And right now they finally have this place, this situation, this position for them to confess to the person that they did not know was their own brother. And so we are going to see what Judah confessed and what they repent of. So first point in this, uh, you know, 20 verses from verse 14 to verse 34. Okay. So first thing I need you to focus on is that Judah, you know, we shows his repentance over their self-centeredness or their self center. Okay. Why would I pinpoint that? When the time they decided to sell off Joseph, like 22 years ago, a little bit family background again, they were jealous of Joseph. They noticed that their own father, Jacob only favored Joseph to the point that they, well, J Jacob practically give a very colorful, um, uh, what's that? What's that thing? The, the ointment uh, cloak to Joseph. And that had ticked them off. Okay. It's like Jacob's favoritism over Joseph is like so obvious to the point that Jacob had to give him a cloak to signify that, okay, this is my love to my boy. Okay. As if all the other sons were not even there. Okay. And then the two dreams that Joseph has shared with the entire family really pushed them over the edge because in Judah and all the brothers mind is like, okay, you already got all our father's love. Okay. And right now your stupid dream are, are, are telling us that we are going to bow down to you. We don't even like you, man. So all that to say the brothers really only want to focus on what they want at that time. And which is, we don't want to see our little brother Joseph anymore. And we don't care really about whoever that we are going to get hurt. All that we want is that we don't want to see them any, well, we, we don't want to see him anymore and we need to get rid of him. To the point, don't forget, to the point that they were planning to kill Joseph, but only when they see that, okay, there are some, um, uh, business people traveling down to Egypt and somehow Judah had the idea that, okay, let's just sell this boy off and then we will profit off from the boy and we can, well, kind of get our, uh, emotions released 
you know, we don't have to, uh, you know, look at this boy anymore. You know, every time we look at him, he just takes us off. So the self-center only focus on what they want and they never really think about their own father, the fate of Joseph and all the other family dynamics that may or, you know, happen after they sell Joseph off. And so self-centered people only focus on what they want. And right here throughout this 20 verses, Judah repeatedly focus on how his father is going to be, how Benjamin is going to be. And from this 20 verses, you can actually see that Judah really, really doesn't want his own father to go through whatever Jacob went through 22 years ago when the time they sold Joseph off to Egypt. And so this, this right here, well, you can still say that, well, he was only talking, right? Words means nothing much. I mean, repentance doesn't really only focus on the word, but actually focus on the actions, right? Yeah, don't forget, by the end of the chapter, you know, uh, look again in uh, verse 33. Yep, verse 33. J Judah said, now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy and let the boy return with his brothers. You see, Judah really took responsibility unto his own promise to his father. He no longer care about whether his well-being is the only thing that he focused on, but then now he knew that I could not let my father go through the tragedy that we in uh we uh how should I, we make that happen okay I, I i simply could not let my father to relive the situation 22 years ago and we made that happen i couldn't let my father do it so let me take the place of the boy and let him go home to my father so you can literally see that judah repent of his self-centeredness and don't overlook this one simple thing right here. Self-centered usually create a lot of problems that lead you to sinning against God. When the time you focus on yourself, but, but not looking at what God wants or what God's uh, Bible say that you should be focusing on, that usually leads you to temptation. Very simple example, okay? We as Christian hold the truth in our lives should preach the gospel, right? Should fulfill the great commission that Jesus command us to do, right? But when the time we focus on ourselves, so what about me? What about my feeling? What about what I want? What about what I love to do, you know? So when the time my uh, favorite TV show or right now, you know, my favorite Netflix or my movies are on, but then at the same time, that's the time that I usually go to read the Bible or I usually go to fellowship, which one do I choose? So, you know, as Christian, we should, you know, focus on what God wants, you know, we should go to fellowship, right? But then self-centeredness, when it kicks in, the temptation also leaps up to you and say that, you know what, you have been pretty good in the past 52 weeks, missing one week is not that bad, right? And so when the time we focus on what I want, that usually create a tension between choosing what God wants and choosing what I want. And of course, you know, Judah's example, selling Joseph off is quite an extreme example of what self-centeredness would, uh, you know, tempt you to do. But then usually if we think about, or if we examine our lives, self-centered usually would create quite a lot of temptation and usually lead us to fight against like, you know, what I want and what God wants. So don't overlook this one point. And if, the Holy Spirit convicts you that, you know, yeah, you always look at what you want instead of what God wants. Hey, maybe it's a good time for us to really think about who do we live for as a Christian? What do we live, you know, based upon, you know, 
whether it's like biblical uh, principle or really I only want to live for myself, for my plan and for my well-being. Well, that's something that you need to struggle with God. And I pray that you would see the value in the kingdom of heaven and the will of God that's so attractive to you that you would actually put away your own plan and live for the will of God, okay? But then this is what Judah, well, the first point in the Judah's confession and his repentance that you can see, okay? And then the second thing is that Judah show his great care for his family over himself, okay? Judah really show he cares and loves his love for his father and for his brothers. Notice that just now I say his, his uh, proposed action in his confession is that let him take the place of the boy and let the boy goes back with his all his brothers, okay? And so this is a great step for us to understand right here. And that is, do you care for other people's well-being over yours? And right here, why I say this is a confession, this is a true repentance, is because long time ago, 22 years ago, he didn't even care whether Jacob would be devastated about the absence of Joseph. He wouldn't even care about Joseph like pleading unto him or unto the, his brother to spare his own life. And according to his brothers later on, you know, in the dungeon, they did mention that, you know, Joseph, they plead to them to spare his life, but then they did not even care. And you can see that the, the lack of caring right there was led by their jealousy and hatred towards the, the family dynamic. And that's why all those jealousy and hatred and uh, unsatisfaction from, you know, Jacob's favoritism over Joseph and, you know, all the other brothers lead them to care nothing. At that point, 22 years ago, when the time they got the first chance to get rid of Joseph, they did it. They didn't even care for anyone. Okay. But then right here, Right here, I believe that in that 22 years time frame, they observed that their father really, really depressed, really, really reject any comfort, and it pains their heart. And that is from my own uh, perspective to, you know, to guess the situation. But as I mentioned in the previous sermons and uh, some time before, I do believe that it haunts them every single day. And for one, they cannot, they could not confess to their own father about what really happened before. They couldn't really tell their own father that now actually we sold Joseph. Joseph did not die, but then we just sold him off. They couldn't because even one of the brothers want to confess. They could not bear the fact that I would bring the other nine brothers down with me and they could never really come to a conclusion. And I can imagine that every single time the brothers gather together, it is in the back of their mind that, yeah, we commit this together and there would be no way out for us. And so not only, not only did they not care for his father and not care for Joseph, they forgot that, well, we also did not care for one another. Can you imagine that the crack in the brother's relationship right there, you know, will he betray me? Will he do the same thing to me? And remember when Joseph first saw them and recognized that this is, these group of men were his own brother, uh, Joseph locked them up. And he especially picked up, you know, uh, Simeon to lock him in the dungeon and let all the, uh, all the other brothers go home. And you, as you can tell, in the mind of Simeon, he might very well think that, oh, will my brother come back for me? Or will my brother just leave me here to rot and die and think that, okay, this is just something that, well, I take it for the group. I will take the consequences of the sin. So 
everything broke down. Everything broke down simply because they did not care for anything. Their jealousy, their hatred to Joseph took everything over. But then, right here in this chapter, Judah, time and time again, brought up one very important character in their lives, and that is how would their father feel? How would their father live if we allow Benjamin to be your slave here and we go home? We could not bear the news for my father anymore. He has suffered in love long enough without ever knowing the truth, without ever knowing what happened to Joseph. And right now you are going to tell me that I need to bear the bad news once again to my old age father. No, I could not do that. I would rather be your slave than to deliver that news to my father. No, I could not bear it. So the entire confession here is not just repeating what we read in ch uh, from chapter 42, 43, and right now. This is a you know gut-wrenching confession from Judah about what he had done wrong to his father. And he could not do it again. And so he took up the full responsibility right here and showed that he really repents of his careless uh, or heartless or cruelty that he performed 22 years ago selling off Joseph. And so even right now, Joseph uh, tell them that, oh no, whoever had the cup, he will be my slave. Okay, and all of you guys can go. Okay, take your silver, you know, take your food, just go. You know, I don't want you guys to be here. So it, the, Judah and his brothers had the perfect opportunity to just say that, okay, yeah, well, Benjamin, too bad for you. Uh, we are going to go home, okay? If they never repent, they would not, they would not, um, you know, have this conversation with Joseph, especially Judah. You know, he was the one who pocketed the 30, I think it's 30 pieces of silver, but I don't remember the exact quantity. I may mix them up with, uh, you know, uh, in the New Testament, how much uh, Judah sold off uh, Jesus. But then Judah was the one in, in here. He was the one who pocketed the silver selling off Joseph. But then right now, even if he had the chance, he had the opportunity, he did not take it. So Christians, did you see how much he repented? How much he regretted selling off Joseph and broke his father's life in pieces. And right now he would rather himself be the slave than to allow his own father to go through the heartbrokenness once again. So that part of the confession, you have to see it. Okay. And the last thing, the last thing, okay, is that he kept his word as a brother, an elder brother in his home. Okay. Meaning that he once again took up his position in the family and took full responsibility. At a glance, you may find that, well, is that something that he repent of? Yes, I would say yes. Okay. And it is a, in, an important part as well. And some, some, sometimes we don't really think about that this is something that we need to do, but then it actually is a big part of our repentance as a Christian as well. Okay. And let me elaborate a little bit more. Okay. Judah, uh, you know, starting in uh, chapter 43, he took charge about, you know, we are going down to Egypt to buy food again. So father, if you do not, you know, allow Benjamin to go with us, we can't go, right? And then Judah took up the full responsibility as the one who would personally guarantee, you know, Benjamin's safety back home, all right? And why would that be important? Because he finally be the brother at home, be the son at home, be the responsible son and responsible brother 
unto his family member. And this, this part right here, a lot of us overlooked about the title that we are born with or we are going to take up in life. Okay, so let's say, okay, take, take myself as an example, okay? I'm a pastor in church, right? But at the same time, I'm, I'm my parent's son and I'm, my, I'm, I'm the husband of my wife and I'm the father of three children. So all this title comes with a proper biblical responsibility with them. It's not something that you just call me and I will respond to you, okay? If they are not my children, they call me father, hey, uh, I don't think I bear that title in front of you, right? And with that title means that there are certain responsibility that I as a father of three children, as a husband to my wife, as a son to my parents, would carry. Okay, simple example, right? I, you know, I, uh, according to the Bible, a husband ought to love their wives. Wife, singular, okay? Not, 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 not plural. <laughs> husband must love their wife as Jesus loved the church, right? That's the biblical principle. And so with the title husband to my wife, do I love my wife with all my heart, right? And that title comes with that responsibility. And as a father to my children, I have the responsibility to raise them up according to the Bible, meaning that I need to teach them about God I need to teach them about how to worship God, how to follow God, how to live their lives upon the biblical principle. And that would comes, you know, those responsibility comes with my title. I cannot omit them. And most time we did not look at this one verse is in the book of Jude verse six. Okay. Let me flip that and quote the exact, um, exact verse to you. At, and it's in the book of Jude, uh, verse 6. And if you're wondering which chapter, obviously you'd never read it. Because <laughs> it's only have one chapter in it. All right. In the book of Jude, verse 6. And the angels who did not keep the positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, these he, he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. And I need you to focus on the scripture, how the scripture described those angels. The angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home. Okay, focus once again. The angels who did not keep their positions of authority. What does that actually mean? When the time they sin against God, they did not keep their positions of authority. God placed them there for the purpose of God. And they did not keep their position of authority. And think about it. Let this sink into you. Let's say if a husband did not keep his position of authority, what does that actually mean? Meaning that the husband is about to give up on the vow, on the wedding vow that the man vowed unto his wife to take good care of her until death do them apart. Meaning that, well, if the husband is heading for divorce, he did not keep his position of authority. If the father abandoned home and just left the entire family, he had left, he did not keep the position of authority. It's that simple. And that right there comes from, you know, the person not taking full responsibility unto the title that he had owned in his life. And that's why I say most of the time we overlook this point 
and just think that, you know what, I did not steal, I did not lie, you know, I'm pretty good, I got nothing to repent. Well, take a look at your life again. You have quite some title that you have today. Did you keep your position of authority in front of God? If not, well, bad news or good news, you have something to repent in front of God. If you never love your wife as Jesus loved church, if you never think about that you need to bring your children, you need to educate them about the word of God, about who God is, about how they should live their lives in front of God in the biblical principle that you study from the word of God, then hey, you did not really keep the position of, of authority that you had. You may say that, okay, uh, in that case, you know, I'm not a father, you know, I'm not a husband, you know, I'm single, you know, and I got no one to care for. So what position of, of authority I should be aware of? Well, if you're a Christian, then that's your position of authority. You are a child of God. Live as one. Live as a child of God in this world. You are the salt of the, of the world, right? You are the light of the world, right? So live in that position of authority as the child of God. Preach the gospel. Preach the Great Commission. Go make disciples of Jesus Christ. Follow God. Worship God. Right here, Judah took back his responsibility, his position of authority as a brother, as a son in Jacob's household. Did you see the difference? 22 years ago, when the time he sold Joseph off, he did not care for any of this thing. Any of it. All that he focused on is whether I pocket the money, whether I can get rid of Joseph, and whether I can get even with my own anger, my own jealous, my own hatred burning inside of me. How do I get rid of them? How do I, you know, release those on Joseph? And he did all those things. He did not keep his position of authority. As a elder brother to take care of his younger brother. As a son who should love and honor his own father. He did not do any of them, but right now in this 20 verses, he did it. He did it. And so, all this to say, all right, true repentance did not just focus on what you say, but what you do. Your repentance, your actions, speaks what you truly repent of. And don't fool yourself if your actions never really repent or, or show repentance of what you did wrong, you never repent before. And if people did not see any transformation that you should have according to the word of God, if people can see that you have no change, then don't fool yourself. You cannot even fool people. What about God? God sees everything. But then right here in this chapter, Judah did say everything that he's supposed to say, and he did exactly what he should do as a brother, as a son in Jacob's household. And this time he's not about to let Benjamin go, even if it brings him down to Egypt, never be able to go home and become a slave in Egypt for the rest of his life. He will do that just to keep his position of authority. And he no longer care only himself, but he care for his father, care for his, uh, his brother. And he finally was an elder brother, a honorable son in Jacob's household. And with all this in mind, and you would see why, or hopefully you would understand deeper why after this speech, Joseph could not hold himself anymore. And he finally revealed himself unto his brothers 
who he truly was. And so don't overlook the power of a true repentance. Don't overlook the power of confession. No one would look down on you when the time you show your true repentance, your, your true confession unto other people. But people would actually honor you because they find an honest person to be either their family member or their friends. No one would want a dishonest person to be their family member, to be their friends. And I hardly find in any occasion that if anyone truly confess and want to repent of their own sins and people will laugh at them. I never see it. The other way around, the more we try to hide our sin, the more we try to cover up our own wrongdoing by continue lying or continue to you know cover it up, at that point, I see people laugh at them because, well, dude, everyone can see what you did. Stop pretending, stop lying. You are making, you are a laughing stock unto other people. And so, brothers and sisters, don't ever see that confession, repentance is a weakness. That is the strength that you have in God. And this chapter right here, I love it so much because Judah show his true repentance and that gives me hope in everyone that we can repent. Even though the, the sin that he committed and at this chapter, he knew that he would never be able to bring Joseph back even after he confessed, even after he repented. But then it should never be something that stops you from repenting in front of God. It should never stop you from confessing your sins in front of God because God is always there to give you a chance, to give you the life to live for him. And so I pray that you would take this chapter in your heart and in that you would do the same thing as Judah and his brother did in this chapter. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time and thank you for this beautiful chapter. Even though it may see, feels like that, it repeats itself, but it actually did not. It shows us that Judah and all his brother repented. They regret making their father's life miserable. And right now they are trying to do everything in their own power to stop his father reliving the misery that they impose on him. And so Father, help us to understand that confession and repentance is not weakness, but it's a strength that we have in front of you. And so Father, May your Holy Spirit guide us and lead us with your grace and mercy to do the same thing that Judah and his brother did and help us to live for you, to live in your word so that, Father, we also live in the true repentance of our own lives. So thank you, Father. Thank you for your grace and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.